you're probably anticipating, oh, here's Rand Fishkin, he, he, he talks a lot about uh, web search, he's gonna say some very kind and wonderful things about Google because he is always nice and respectful and warm and wonderful to Google. In fact, Google and Rand, best friends, BFFs, well-known fact. Uh, no, that's not, an, not entirely accurate. I, I give Google a hard time, not because I don't like them or the company, but because I, I have a lot of challenges um, with their behavior over the last five or six years. That being said, Google has done amazing, remarkable, wonderful things for all of us. They have built up an amazing industry, um, and, and they, they kind of run the web, so maybe, maybe I should be kinder to them for fear of being kicked off. I have so much data uh, to get through today, but before I start, I wanted to give you a quick who is this Rand person? If you don't know, I, uh, I started the company Moz, uh, which runs MozCon, obviously, with my mom, Jillian Musig. Uh, Jillian and I went half a million dollars into debt building a consulting business, <laughs> and then slowly, slowly paid it off by learning SEO and, and doing that for clients. Uh, I then wrote a book about this, if, if, you, if you care about that, uh, called Lost and Founder. This is my grandfather, Seymour Fishkin. He is 92 years old. My grandmother's 93, she's even older. Uh, and they are both still doing well out in uh, New Jersey. Um, and I, I don't think I've ever had a better day than when my grandparents came to, my, uh, came to the launch for the, for the book. That was pretty incredible. It is, it is amazing to be 40 years old and to be able to call your grandparents on the phone. Uh, I left Moz last year and started a new company with this fine looking gentleman here, Casey Henry. Uh, who is just lovely. And today, I have six stories for you and a tremendous amount of information. I thought I would try and put that information into some form of narrative to help it uh, be absorbed a little bit better. But that being said, there are a ton of charts and graphs that will be gone through in 10 seconds or less. And that seems a little rude not to make them all available. So if you go to this URL, bit.ly web search 2019, you will find a Google Drive file. Uh, that Google Drive file has the PowerPoint. You can download and install it, uh, or you can view it through Google Drive itself. Not every slide will look quite as perfect and polished, because depending on whether you have the fonts installed, but that's OK. So let's start with a story about how we use the web. You remember back in, uh, some of you maybe remember, uh, back in, 1980, in the 1980s when MTV launched and the, the very first uh, video that came out was of course the, the Bugles, Video Killed the Radio Star. And in 2001, there were all those news articles about how computers and the internet are gonna be the death of television. And we talked about how apps are gonna make websites redundant. I think I probably had uh, hundreds of conversations over the course of those few years after the iPhone launched about that. And mobile, mobile is gonna kill desktop. Voice search now, voice search is gonna kill web search. Let, let me tell you why I'm so skeptical about this. So here is uh, radio listenership, online and offline, podcast use. Th those numbers look like they're going up and to the right. Here is time spent on television and mobile devices. I've stolen a few of these from uh, Mary Meeker's excellent Internet Trends deck. But you can see that Yes, it looks like television use is going down a little bit and mobile device use is going up, right? And they're, they're, maybe mobile is cannibalizing television. Maybe. Oh, what are we doing on our devices? We're watching television. Look, look at TV use, look at 2015 versus 2005. There's actually more linear television watched in 2015 than 2005. That's, that's madness. Here's uh, desktop and mobile. Mobile has overtaken desktop percentage-wise, but, but, right? We see here's desktop and mobile uh, ad spend versus time spent. They have balanced out now. Advertisers, marketers, all of us uh, have sort of distributed our investments reasonably well, with the exception of uh, podcasts and radio. But here's hours spent, and look. Do you see what I see? Mobile didn't kill desktop. It just killed all our free time. 
So there's, you see usage predictions like this. Uh, every event that I go to, there, is, there are session after session about the dangers of voice search, how voice search is gonna cannibalize web search, end web search, how voice answers are, are gonna be seriously problematic. And I, okay, okay, I think, I think there's some truth to this reality. Maybe there's some fair concern here, but let's poke just a little bit deeper. I, I tried hundreds of searches uh, Brittany, I'm pretty sure you have actually found a couple of searches where the, where the answers are different. But I, I tried them and I could not find one where there was any difference between if I typed it in to my, my mobile device or my desktop device versus I spoke it to my device. As long as the device has a screen, the answers seem to be exactly the same. The results are the same. However, if I talk to the device and I ask it for a voice answer, then I get a big difference. This is no search opportunity for anyone, no branding opportunity for anyone, no traffic for anyone, no clicks for anyone. Very, very minimal value to marketers, if any value to marketers. Uh, you can imagine maybe a few searches where you could get some. So, okay, I'll give you voice answers but we do not have statistics about voice answers. Every number that you see or have seen in the, out in the web is either a survey about how often voice answers are used, survey data being, in my opinion, extraordinarily unreliable, or it is numbers coming from uh, Amazon's Alexa or Siri or, or Google talking about voice search, voice search, not voice answers. So I tried to look, right? I, I, I asked the folks at JumpShot, who I work with closely, you would think, I I'm gonna present so much jump shot data in this deck that you might think to yourself, does Rand work with or for jump shot? Do they pay him? No, in fact, I pay jump shot. But I love their data and, and they have incredible stuff and they're very kind and generous to me and when I said, hey, I need all this data for MozCon, they, they put it all together um, and got it to me last week. So I have very fresh data for you uh, all the way up to June of this year. So you can see Google search data in browsers which is unfortunately all that JumpShot can get, they can't get app data, is plateauing. When you add in app data, when you factor in the fact that, that Google's mobile search app is used uh, probably at least half the time for, uh, for all searches that are done on mobile, it's almost certainly still growing. So there are, as Sarah noted earlier, more searches than ever before, more people searching than ever before. And browser-based usage is still at all-time highs. We are not seeing a decline in number of pages visited per month or number of domains visited, other than the app cannibalization I mentioned. But, but e even in the browser, right, on desktop, we're seeing the same that we saw years and years ago, meaning the web is still where all this activity is taking place. <sighs> and I asked Jumpshot, hey, can you tell me who's sending web traffic? Well. I don't know if that's good news or bad news, but uh, Google is absolutely dominant. I think this is no surprise why the search industry has gotten so massive over the last few years. So if we go back in time, right, like over 40 years, video grew, but it, it never killed radio. You could argue today that radio or, or radio plus podcasts are healthier than they've ever been, more used than they've ever been. TV, same story. Desktop, it's barely shrunk. Websites still dominate apps. Outside, for anyone outside the top 25 apps, websites are absolutely the, the right investment. And despite voice, web use, web search keeps growing. So I, I am extremely skeptical when someone says new technology will destroy old usage. That is not the pattern we have seen over the last 40 years of technology adoption. I, 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 don't, I don't buy it. If you're, if you're someone who thinks, oh, I think cryptocurrency will end the use of you know, regular money, I, I have my skepticism, right? If you think uh, AI will kill all the jobs, I, I have a lot of skepticism. And I think we have the data to back that up. So for each of these stories, I, I'm gonna try and, and succinctly show you what it means for you as a marketer. And I think in this case, we're talking about three things. One both mobile and desktop are still big. If you are building mobile first, that's fine. 
If you are building mobile only, I think that's dangerous because desktop use is still very high. Desktop conversion rates are quite high, and I'll, I'll show you later that click-through rates on desktop are much higher than they are on mobile, meaning that for many folks who get organic search traffic, desktop is still a big place to play. If you're thinking about a big investment in voice answer SEO, right, essentially trying to uh, build apps for it, trying to solve queries that way, I think it's too early. I don't think this is the year to make that investment. Uh, if you are at the very cutting edge and you're obsessed with it and you think you have just the right app for it or just the right company for it, okay, great. You, you do you. I think for 99% of us, it's not the right investment to make yet. Uh, that's not to say that there's not a lot of other voice investments that, are, that aren't worthwhile. Uh, and third, video, podcasts, websites, all continue to be excellent investments. Mobile apps, I don't see it. I don't think most companies will benefit from having a separate mobile app. There are exceptions, sure, but unless you are mobile-centric and very app-centric, I think, I think for the vast majority of, of traffic earners through SEO, it is the way, to go, the way to go is still the web. Oh, this is a fun story. Oh, how delightful. Uh, remember I said I was gonna say wonderful things about Google? So uh, Google has, a, a very, very competent, very smart CEO uh, who is ex extraordinary um, at, at growing that business. I think if any of you are stockholders in Google over the last 10 years, you've, you've certainly been very, very happy with Sundar Pichai. And uh, Mr. Pichai went to Congress in December of last year, so six months ago, six, seven months ago and sat down and got asked loads of questions by, by lots of members of Congress. Some of them were reasonably intelligent questions, some of them less so. A few of those questions really pissed me off. Re sorry, the answers to them really pissed me off. Here are three. What percentage of search engine result pages result in the user terminating the search uh, without clicking anything, uh, clicking on a link to a website that was hosted by Google itself or by Alphabet itself? And, and you can see the CEO's answers, which I think is a total dodge. It does not directly answer the question. There is no way that it is true that Google doesn't measure that. I, I find that disingenuous at best and an outright bald-faced lie at worst. And I don't know how it is okay to go in front of the United States Congress and sit down and be asked questions that you know the answer to and not tell the truth. That seems dangerous to me. Do they not have power over CEOs? I don't, maybe I'm not understanding how democracy and capitalism work together, but fine. If Google CEO won't answer these questions, jump shot and I, We'll do it for them. Here you go. Zero click searches. This is in Q1 of 2019. I'll show you a little Q2 data in a sec. Organic clicks, 41%. This is across mobile and desktop. We have about 10 million, we, JumpShot has about 10 million devices uh, that they monitor in the United States. Uh, so very statistically significant amounts here. Paid clicks, 3.58. Alphabet. These are, these are all properties owned by Alphabet, but it's probably not entirely comprehensive, but close. And zero click searches, 48.96%. Fairly substantial. If you take a look over time, the last uh, three years, you will see that Google sent about 20% fewer organic visits. This is via browser, right? Because we, we don't have app data, but we can assume it is quite similar. Uh, app search being very similar to, to uh, mobile experience than in 2016. So that is a substantial decline. Maybe apps, I think the, the Google mobile search app probably grew more than 20% over that time. So there are probably a similar number or even more clicks available, but you can definitely see the trend, which is Google cannibalizing a lot of that. If we go back in time to 2016, right? It's Q1 2016, we're having this conversation. There are 26 organic clicks for every one paid search click. Every one paid ad click has, has accordingly, right, across all of Google, 26. 2019, 11. 11 is still big, I mean, that's, 
you know, that, that, that's an order of magnitude and a little more bigger. Uh, organic search is still an order of magnitude larger than paid search in terms of traffic overall. But a lot of that is probably organic clicks that are going to, uh, uh, br for branded search and informational search, it's not necessarily commercial. Fascinatingly, uh, you might have seen in Q1 of this year that uh, Google's ad revenue earnings growth rate was down a little bit. Bloomberg made this um, kind of ruthless chart. I don't know if you can see the axis over there, but it uh, tries, to, tries to make the problem worse than it is. Investors uh, reacted pretty negatively to this, though, right? Sending Google's stock price down significantly, for those of you who are Google shareholders. And Google reacted. They're not going to take that standing down. Do you know how they reacted? You, you can just shout it out, it's cool. They, that's right, yes, correct. They changed how the ads looked so that it was very hard to tell the difference between ads and non-ads. There's what it looked like in April, and then in late May, they made it look like that. Uh, this is on the mobile, the mobile version. And as a result, I have the, the uh, I asked Jumpshot for the June data, Ooh, look at that, look at that. Plus 16% ad click-through growth, uh, click-through rate growth uh, over just that month, that one change. That is pretty good. Imagine being able to grow 16% by making a little green ad logo into a little black one. That is, that is a sweet lever to be able to pull for, for growth. And Google, I, I, I think they, they try and argue that they're not a monopoly. So again, I, I looked at the jump shot data for all searches across all the places where search happens on the web, and 95% of it in the United States happens on Google properties. Not a monopoly, what, what are you talking about? So you might recall that in 2013, uh, the Obama FTC investigated Google. They investigated Google, and their findings were beyond damning. Officials concluded that Google illegally scraped other websites for reviews and other information and passed off the content as its own. They threatened to remove sites from its search engine if it couldn't scrape their content. Oh, damn. It barred advertisers from using data obtained on Google search uh, ad campaigns for ad campaigns on other search engines. Oof, oof. And caused significant harm to websites by favoring its own shopping, travel, and local content in searches. It's not like they didn't know, but there was uh, a political intervention from, specifically from, from the Obama administration. I, any, anybody who follows me online knows that politically speaking, I, I was generally a big fan of the Obama administration, but I think this was a terrible, terrible move. And I think you can see the impact and influence of lobbying and the connection between Google and the Obama administration from this decision not to make action. There were four uh, FTC officials who voted against taking action and three who voted for it. So this was a very close vote. The Trump administration, which I have many problems with, uh, but they, their Justice Department uh, is currently reopening an investigation. This time it's not the FTC, it's the Justice Department uh, reopening an antitrust probe of Google and Congress is gonna start asking questions. Uh, I've actually been emailing weirdly with some members of Congress. I know, me, what are they thinking? I like turtles. <laughs> All right, so how, how, does this, how does this impact you? How does this impact us as search marketers? Google's behavior here means paid click-through rate has risen, but if history is any guide, every time they make a change like this, you essentially see the click-through rate uh, go up, and then it, it, it quickly goes down again. So over the next six months, paid click-through rate is likely to go down as searchers get more familiar with the new ad format and become immune to it, right? Uh, become familiar. Organic click-through rate is still very high. And there are a ton of there's a ton of opportunity still in Google search. There's probably just as much as there was three, four, five years ago, maybe even a little bit more because of the growth of, mo of the mobile app. However, however, if you are an SEO who can invest in and win branding value, marketing value from zero click searches, searches that result in no click at all, you are gonna be significantly ahead of your peers. I'm gonna talk about zero click searches a little more uh, later on. And finally, 
the 2020 uh, general election and the Democratic primary are almost certainly going to have a very big impact on web search and on Google. If, if it is the case that uh, Joe Biden, who I think is currently in the lead for the D Democratic nomination, if he, if he wins that, he is almost certainly going to act similarly to the Obama administration, and we are much less likely to see action taken against Google. If, however, you know, someone like an Elizabeth Warren wins, uh, she has put out plans to uh, potentially split Google and YouTube, potentially split out maps. I, I think that would create a tremendous amount of competition and opportunity also complexity, but could be a very, very interesting and different landscape. And of course, if the Trump administration wins again, uh, that we, would, we would probably see some form of penalty, fine, um, action taken. So it's weird. I, I cannot remember a time ever speaking at MozCon, ever in the history of my 20 years in SEO, when an election probably determined what would happen with Google and search. That is. Remarkable. Okay, let's, speaking of zero-click searches, let's talk briefly about on-serp SEO. I don't know if uh, many of you saw this. There was, a, there was a story on Social Media Examiner from Michael, uh, I think his name is Stelzner, and he, he's the owner, he's the, uh, the founder of, of Social Media Examiner, and he talked about how it, the Google search traffic is dying. It's over, it's dead. How many, how many times have you heard that before? Oh my God killing me, man. Uh, the only thing that's dead is saying Google and SEO are dead. But, but, here is, here's the case that he made. It's not a super strong case, but it, it, it is interesting. He said, I rank number three for social media, which is, which is impressive. That is a search that gets a tremendous amount of volume, tremendous amount of volume, millions of searches a year. That is where I show up. He's not wrong. And here's his Google Search Console. My God, 1.4 million impressions, 11,000 clicks. Whew. That is, that is ugly. That, that sucks. Damn. Yikes. I, I, I feel a lot of empathy for that. that. That's a lot of work to get to that ranking and get very minor benefit. And they're not alone. Uh, this was uploaded by, by Lily Ray, who's a wonderful SEO. And you can see there, Lily was working with a client, unnamed client, added the FAQ schema to the pages on the website and saw that happen. Essentially, impressions rose dramatically, ranking rose dramatically, clicks fell dramatically. I think a lot of SEOs are very scared about this. Right? We're going to listen, uh, uh, I think Brittany Muller is talking about you know, how to get featured snippets, how to uh, you know, put schema into your website pages, how to get all this rich markup and data. If this is what's going to happen, I'd be pretty nervous about going to my boss or my client, my team, and saying, hey, I'm going to get us a higher ranking and a featured snippet, and we're going to lose a lot of traffic. <laughs> Who's excited? Who's with me? Yeah. Yeah, those zero-click searches are brutal, right? Click through, cl here's click-through rates. Uh, this is just the United States, but there's, there's June, 50% for the first time. Very first time in June, zero-click searches, when you blend mobile and desktop, more than half of all searches are now zero-click. That's not, that's not pretty either. You search for a shrug emoji. This is a very important emoji to me. It's the one, it's the one where the little guy is like, mm? which I need all the time. So I search for it all the time, and then I just copy it from the SERP and paste it right into usually Twitter. I usually need it as a reply on Twitter. There's the shrug emoji. <laughs> emoji. And if I'm HubSpot, OK, this is a 10 blue link search. There's no featured snippet, right? There's not a lot of stuff mucking up the results, right? Non-link non stuff mucking up the results. But what is the value in ranking for this search? It's pretty hard to earn ROI here. If I, however, look at something like uh, uh, steak temperature medium, right? How do I get a medium? What, what's the temperature I should aim for on my, on my grill with my thermometer? There's a featured snippet. It's pretty rich, but there is a clear path to ROI. If, I am, if I'm these folks uh, uh, down here, right, the Thermo Pro, 
yeah, I probably want that featured snippet, even if it doesn't mean clicks. I'd rather have it. How does this impact you? I, I believe that the way to think about this is, is via a simple decision tree. And, and this is what I would show to my team, my boss, my client, whoever it is, when, we, I, when, when I'm asked about, hey, should we use this markup? Hey, should we install this schema? Hey, should we optimize for this search that's gonna get us probably fewer clicks if we do it right? Here's the decision tree. Can I benefit from ranking for this query without traffic? Is the branding value, the, the opportunity to control the information that people see, is that valuable? If the answer is no, all right, go find other keywords. There are plenty of them. The long tail is super long. It is, uh, there's more demand there than ever before. If the answer, however, is yes, you gotta ask a second question. Is your team or your client gonna give you credit? If that answer is no, go for those other keywords. If, however, it's yes, it's time to invest in on SERP SEO. Right? On SERP SEO is the practice of optimizing for what appears in the results even if and, and when it doesn't draw traffic. What about structured data? Real similar. Are you gonna gain or lose value from adding that structured data to your page, if, assuming that Google may use that in an answer box that takes away clicks? And if you can gain value from that, branding value, marketing value, familiarity, go for it. If you're gonna lose, you have to ask the next question, which is, I'm gonna lose, but would I rather have it than a competitor? Would I rather have it than a competitor? And only if that answer is, I'd, I'd, rather, I'd rather not have it, then go find other keyword opportunities. Otherwise, you still need to optimize. a heavy topic. So back in 2012, a, uh, a very evil man went to Newtown Elementary School, uh, uh, the, the Sandy Hook Elementary School, and killed 26 children with a gun. I, I, I don't really know, I don't know how to process that, I don't know how to deal with that, I don't even have kids, and I don't know how to deal with that, but the worst part, maybe even worse than the killer himself was what happened afterward, which is that when you searched Google for the Sandy Hook Elementary School shooting, you found thousands, maybe millions of results from websites and conspiracy theorists who believed that the event was staged staged by actors and, I don't know, somehow connected to chemtrails and uh, it, 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 just insanity, right? You can read interviews with the parents who lost their kids that day, who were basically driven mad, driven out of town, driven to suicide, multiple people driven to suicide because of the, the conspiratorial belief that, that their children never existed, that it was all a fake. Just, just heartbreaking, and Google, took a long time to take this seriously, but eventually they did. Uh, and there's now, there's now, there was a piece in The Guardian just a few days ago about talking about what Google did to react in particular to mass shootings. It's unfucking believable that we have so many mass shootings in the United States that, that this is an issue that comes up again and again for Google, but it does. And, and every time it does, there's conspiracy theories around it. And so Google, uh, has this, this notion of authority. They say authority, I believe they mean both authority and correctness uh, in their algorithm, and they, they ramped it up, right? They basically said, for queries like this, we should increase our notions of authority, increase the weight of authority in our rankings so that we surface high quality content rather than misinformation at this critical time. I, I don't think that's perfectly transparent, but I think it is suggestive of something that is real and going on in the search results and affecting a lot more than just uh, conspiracy types of searches. So if you search for Sandy Hook shooting today, you will not see uh, that conspiracy stuff. I couldn't even find it going to page four, page five, right? Google has essentially gotten rid of that type of stuff. They've done that for a lot of searches. Uh, measles, right, of course this, um, 
related conspiratorial anti-vaxxer movement that is completely non-scientific and, and medically bereft of any uh, uh, value and, and very harmful, right, to immunocompromised children who, who can't be vaccinated. Uh, we had a, an outbreak here in Washington State, actually, at the, uh, uh, the border with Oregon recently. And despite measles being eliminated, right, you can see that it's, it's rising again due to this. And, and so Google, right, tr is trying to surface information. They've made a lot of changes, especially in the vaccine space and medical information space, to do the same thing they did in the uh, mass shooting space, which is to provide accurate information from sort of trustworthy, authoritative sources. They do this for things like, is the Earth flat? Which, as many of you might have known, uh, the flat Earth conspiracy theory. This is this is a real thing. I'm not I'm not kidding you. Like it has risen dramatically. There are people who believe that the Earth is absolutely flat. I assume they've never been in planes, but. I have no explanation for this other than madness reigns supreme. Uh, and, and so, I mean, the answer box there is, that's a good start. It's a good start, but, but, the, but the results are similar. And this is not just true for these types of searches. So here, uh, Cyrus, you pointed out uh, a few weeks ago on Twitter that this website, Mercola.com, which has been a, a source of anti-vax information, misleading medical information, been sued by the government for my, my, my favorite one that they have is the, 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 the doctor behind the website claims that when you go outside and get sunshine uh, and you get critical vitamin A, you, you can't take a shower afterward because you'll wash off the vitamins. And this is a very popular website. They were getting like a ton of traffic. Um, but Google basically, in, in one of their recent uh, algorithmic updates, determined this is not an authoritative website. We need to uh, decrease their ranking dramatically. And so in a lot of cases, right, they, I, I think a question to ask is like, does this rank because it has the right links or because it best satisfies searchers or it has the best on-page SEO or the most accurate info or it structures information the best so that Google can, can put it up there or it comes from a trusted source. And it looks, it looks like these two ranking factors, which haven't historically been a huge part of what we thought about in SEO, are on the rise, right? We're sort of moving from this world where links, clicks, keywords uh, are, are important still, but so too are accuracy and comprehensiveness. Right? So, so Google sort of has this, this concept of queries where the, if, if there's you know, no particularly right or dangerous answer, then it is totally fine to not have as authoritative information in there. But if right, that risk is high and the wrong answer could cause serious harm, are vaccines safe, homeopathic cancer cures, right? that's dangerous stuff. Best Star Wars movie, meh, you know, a lot of people could rank for that. Capybara memes, I don't, maybe Ian thinks it's super important. I know, I know you need uh, your capybara memes, but for the rest of us, less so. And I think, I think it pays to ask the question, could authority and comprehensiveness and accuracy come to your SERP, and are you set up for success if that happens? This evolving algo, again, three, three big things. I think establishing your site as an authority or earning links from or content on existing authorities to control the information could have big ranking benefits. Improving your content accuracy, that means up to date, it means comprehensive, it means correct, uh, could boost your rankings and earn you those featured snippets. And, and being at the cutting edge, especially in YMYL, your money or your life types of queries as Google calls them, could have adverse effects if you are rejecting authoritative consensus. Right? If all of the important websites in your space say that one thing is going on and you say something different, it may take until there's a change in basically the uh, uh, popular uh, view before you can rank for that stuff. A couple of years ago at MozCon, I talked about a story from the outline about the, uh, the business CelebrityNetWorth.com. And uh, the outline did a wonderful story on them, basically talking about how they had contacted, Google had contacted, emailed the, the founders of Celebrity Net Worth and said, hey, we would love to use your information uh, in you know, our, our rankings. We, we would like to have a sort of an answer box that has all your stuff in there. Do you know what they offered to pay? 
That's correct, zero dollars. They offered to pay absolutely nothing. The founders of Celebrity Net Worth said, no, we're not interested in working with you. Despite that, Google stuck all the information in there. They, they, they crawled the website, right? They put, they put the instant answers in, and Celebrity Net Worth knew that they did it because the founders put a bunch of their friends' names in with false values and then found that when you Googled net worth of you know person uh, who's a random friend of the founder, the answer from Celebrity Net Worth came up. This, I thought, was a relatively isolated event. It proved to be something very different. So the Wall Street Journal recently wrote about a lyrics website called Genius.com, uh, one of my favorite SEO case studies of all time. So Genius.com saw that Google was scraping their information, uh, putting them into the lyrics box, and was claiming that they paid a third-party service, which you know, was supposedly aggregating the lyrics themselves. So Genius did something genius. They took the apostrophes, two different kinds, a straight apostrophe and a curly apostrophe, and they put them into their lyrics so that in Morse code, the curly and straight apostrophes in the lyrics, in the song lyrics, would spell out the words red-handed. <laughs> and then they brought it to the Wall Street Journal. The journal published a piece about it. They published a video about it, shaming Google. A week later, Google changed how they display lyrics credits. They are now in there. Now, there, there's still some genius results in there that are improperly credited to someone else, but at least genius knows who's scraping them uh, and, and, and putting that data in for Google, right? And then charging Google money for it because uh, Lyric Find does have a contract with Google. 18 months ago, I don't know if you recall, there was the, the Getty Images uh, uh, issue where they, they made the change to add uh, links in there. They uh, added links in knowledge panels and images and featured snippets. I think this was a while ago, uh, but, but the knowledge panel is, is newer. And this has a big impact for all of us because if Google is using your work without crediting your site, which I think is gonna happen to more and more people, your ally is the press. Google appears to take real action when the press is contacted. That Justice Department investigation that we talked about earlier, I believe that is going to lead investigators to seek out cases where Google has caused real business harm. So if this is happening to you or to your clients and you can prove it by whatever means, it has never been a better time to be vocal. And finally, when Google does return link credit to SERPs, like in the images especially, uh, opportunity rises. There is a lot of opportunity that is probably being missed by SEOs in some of those places. All right, my last story. Let's talk a little bit about engagement. So uh, we are gonna get into the social media realm and I'll explain in a minute why this is so absolutely crucial, even if all you do is, is search. Organic reach, a few years ago, right, was in the four or 5% range and we were complaining bitterly because it had dropped from 20%. Uh, the average Facebook page with, I think, more than 10,000 uh, fans is now 0.09%. Uh, what? Uh, Twitter, 0.048%. Instagram, 1.73% and falling. It looks like uh, this number is even lower as of last month. What's rising is viral content, right? Content that uh, sails across the web, that, that essentially across all of social media, rather than our feeds being as personalized as they have been in the past, a lot of the content is being shown to many, many more of us from a few sources. I think it's reasonable to ask this question. Rand, I'm an SEO. I do content stuff. Why should I care about social reach? Because the content that earns traction on these platforms Twitter in particular, Twitter in particular, which I know many people think, gosh, Twitter is like this little microcosm. It, doesn't, it is not representative, but Twitter is where action happens that turns into what high influence accounts amplify across all platforms, Facebook included, Instagram included. It's what people search for. It's what bloggers who are very heavily on Twitter write about. It's what journalists who are very, very heavy and overrepresented on Twitter write about. It's what earns links without action. It's what the press cites. It's what tends to rank in Google, which is why I believe the correlation is so high 
supply between social shares and rankings. I think we have to care about this, uh, unless, unless you love doing manual link outreach. And the way these systems work is that they predict how interesting and engaging a uh, particular you know, tweet or an Instagram post or whatever it is, right? We, they all are using machine learning systems to figure out what engages us, what addicts us to the platform, what keeps us on there. So when I look at my Twitter feed, this is the tweet the algorithm thinks is most likely to engage me, keep me on there, get me to reply, get me to share. This is what they think is second most, third most, et cetera. Instagram, same way. Explore tab, feed, same way. They think this video of Megan Rapinoe is gonna keep me watching. They're, they're, they're right, I totally watched it. Uh, they think these images will keep me in the app, right? This is how YouTube decides that after I watch this uh, chemtrails conspiracy video, I should find out if the earth is actually flat. 27 million views, this is not like a small conspiracy, my friends, right? There's a lot of, uh, this is how Facebook decides what goes into our feed. This is what, one of my favorite examples from, uh, from Facebook. The, Six and a half million views, 110,000 likes in seven hours, 30,000 people watching it right now, totally fake. None of it is real. There is no plastic bits mixed into rice. Plastic bits are more expensive to make than rice. This is total insanity. But it engages, keeps us there. Engagement, not amplification, powers social reach now. It used to be that the retweet or the share was the, the, the way to get content out there. Now it is the thing that people engage with and, and therefore a lot has changed, right? These are trained to create, these machine learning algorithms are trained to create addiction based on engagement. And that can kind of have some nasty side effects, turns out. Uh, this is my wife Geraldine's Twitter account. She, she sends wonderful and lovely tweets. She's very well followed on Twitter and uh, you can see this Delightful tweet, and look, look down at the bottom, beautiful uh, reply from Christy. I just love your love for each other, so inspiring, please keep writing. That is a wonderful comment. But you know what it does not do? It does not make Geraldine go back into Twitter and check every five minutes for more people replying, right, and addict, addict her. You know what does that? High controversy content. High controversy content that gets lots of people hating you and uh, tragically, um, my, my wife is called the C word on Twitter uh, more than anyone else. I think I should probably get an award. Geraldine should get an award for, for that. I guess maybe, maybe the James Beard Award is like a, yeah, for, for being called the C word 10,000 times a day. Uh, and right, so in fact, articles get written about the insults that are hurled at Geraldine why are these people even seeing these tweets? We asked this question and dove into it, and, and when I looked at why this was happening, the answer became very clear, which is that people who, have, uh, very, who don't follow very many people on Twitter are being shown Geraldine's content even though they don't follow her because Twitter's algorithm has learned that it engages them, especially, no offense, but white conservative men uh, in their 30s to 60s uh, who are on Twitter get shown a disproportionate amount of Geraldine's tweets. Her content is not made for them, but it pisses them off, which engages them, which Twitter's algorithm has learned engages them, and so it shows them more. And this, this is a weird externality, very weird externality. If we go back five years in time, social reach was basically, okay, Twitter, you want to get retweets, F uh, Facebook, you want to get shares, uh, Instagram, you want to get large numbers of likes, uh, LinkedIn, you want to get shares by well-connected accounts, right? YouTube, it's views and embeds and links and keywords. But in 2019, it's basically whatever signals the machine learning system has found to correlate strongly with engagement. And that's quite different, right? Those are things like uh, you know, comments and clicks, comments and messages. Uh, on, on Instagram, the influencer communities that hook up on the Telegram app to privately message each other to say, hey, please boost my content on Instagram, they are asking for comments, not likes. Because comments tell the machine learning system there's more engagement. So how does this impact you? As an SEO and content creator, if you want to earn links from high authority sources without doing outreach, amplification and traffic from link likely audiences, branded search demand, people searching for your content, right? Diversity of traffic sources, 
and subscribers who want to get your content every time you produce it, you need to win on social. Social platforms are where this activity is primarily taking place, and outreach is so hard comparatively. So how do you do that? You play to these algorithms bias, right, for on-site engagement. It is not drawing the click, it's drawing the engagement. You use those high engagement streaks to build up your algorithmic reputation with Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, YouTube, et cetera. And then you spend those engagement streaks to earn visits and hopefully subscribers. All right, friends. It's my belief that the future of SEO is a few things. It is a less trackable time, both because of the changes that, that uh, ITP are making, Firefox is making, the Chrome browser is making, and because on SERP SEO appears to be a very big part of our future. We have a way bigger and more competitive industry than ever before. So this is 2015. When I did this search, 634,000 LinkedIn profiles said they had SEO in their job title or description. Ooh. Oh, damn. We got big fast, friends. Fast. 470% increase in five years. That's, that's nuts. 2 point, almost 3 million profiles who say they have it in their, in their job description or title. There's more competition and sophistication in SEO than ever before. Uh, there's a shift in, in searches. Search continues to grow, but organic clicks are probably becoming a smaller share of that. There's a shift in ranking signals. This is just my personal take on things, which I know looks madness. And, and, and there's ever-changing tactical effectiveness. Thank you for demonstrating, Charlie. A lot of people think I look like this guy. Maybe if I just do my hair right. Uh, and MozCon is here to help make you ready. Thank you very much. Thank you.